Welcome to the Susan Brender Show. It's all about you. Featuring shows on health and wellness, the performing arts, politics, and people who inspire you to be your very best. And now, here's Susan Brender. I'm Susan Brender, and this is the Susan Brender Show. Today, I have a very interesting guest on my show who is just absolutely amazing in the things that she does in her life. She's just an incredible person. And, you know, there are some people in this world who have a generosity of spirit that can't be duplicated. And that's my guest today, Marsha. Among the many things she does... Um, she immerses herself into a program called Guardian Ad Litem, and this program is very special. Let's find out more about it, and I want to welcome to my show, Marsha Iwad. Hi, Susan. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. You know, Marsha, before we really get into the subject matter, it is very important that our audience understand what Guardian Ad Litem program is. Um, most people, if, if you say this to them, they don't necessarily know. And I know in other uh, states in this country, you're in Florida, but the, in other states, it's called CASA. Now, tell our audience a little bit about the Ad Litem program. Well, um, the Guardian Ad Litem program and CASA are similar. In fact, they're the same. Um, they just have different names. Uh, CASA means Court Appointed Special Advocates. Guardian Ad Litem uh, stands for a legal term, which means for the suit or for the court. It's a very old uh, term, which uh, King used to appoint guardians to speak on behalf of children or incompetent people. And then in 1974, um, the Child Abuse uh, Prevention and Treatment Act mandated the appointment of guardian ad litem. We're, we're, the, our acronym is GALS <laughs> um, uh-huh. in all cases of child abuse and neglect. So well, it started from there. Interesting. Yeah, and you just mentioned you said GALS. Now, what about men? Uh, do men participate in guardian ad litem as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they definitely do. They definitely do. But um, they've picked up this term and everybody uses it. So whether you're a man or a woman, you're a gal. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, our country has a lot of issues concerning children. Um, very often, single parents uh, who are teenagers have children and they're, they're kids themselves and they don't know how to raise a kid. Now, when you started getting involved in this program, did you do research to find out what it was all about? And did you, and the people whom you met at the very beginning, were they young women, single parents? Who are these people who are participating in, in, in the Guardian Ad Litem program? Well, I'm a little different in terms of the people who typically come into the program. Um, I was a foster parent for almost 15 years, so I I looked at it a little differently. I knew about CASA, and um, I wanted to get involved again in um, in helping children. Typically, the people that I've met that are also gals um, are people who are retired, um, school teachers, nurses, uh, all forms of people. Um, who have in their heart they wanted to make a difference with children, and um, so that's how we. That's how I got started. I looked it up, and um, I found out the office, and then I filled out. I went online and filled out the application, and uh, you have to do a little study, and then there's a training program that you go to. You get fingerprinted, and then after all this is done, you become a guardian ad litem through the court. Now, people who are foster parents often get a very bad rap. Um, People think that they're doing it just for the money, and often they are people who don't necessarily love children, but this is their way of, you know, getting paid to do something. Now, as far as uh, foster parents are concerned, tell us a little bit about that, too, and how one gets involved in becoming a foster parent. I'm just going to tell you that if people go into it for the money, it is definitely not worth it. You get paid a very small amount, a stipend, for taking care of these children. And, um, and, you know, one of the worst things that can happen to children is the feeling of abandonment. So they always come with baggage because of the fear that they carry and the trauma that they have gone through. So just, you know, being taken taken away from their parents. So 
being a foster parent is basically you become a parent. So it doesn't make any difference, um, you know, how you, what you get paid or what you do. You do it because, you know, you want to help children. And becoming a parent means that there's a lot of responsibility for teaching and for uh, guiding and for being supportive. And, um, and it's much, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to be a foster parent, but it is well worth it in the long run. Is and I, no, it's not. I, I have never, of all the years that I was a foster parent, and now I have never felt danger at all. The first set of foster children that I had, the, um, they had been um, abused, sexually abused by a man, and he was, um, he, he was in jail, but his lawyer, he was, was trying to get him out. And the kids, he threatened the kids, and uh, they thought that he was going to come to our door, and they were scared. And um, so what I did was I got a baseball, a baseball bat, and I put it by the door. <laughs> I've never touched anyone in my life, but I was trying to think of a way to let them know that they would be safe. And I said, if anyone comes to that door that you're afraid of, that you think is going to hurt you, that's what the bat is for. So we'll just leave it there. And they felt so much better after that. So, of course, nothing ever happened. But um, I'm saying that, you know, your job is to help support these children, and that means in every aspect of their life. All right. So let's talk a little bit about that because people uh, really, again, don't know what goes on in the situation where you are a foster parent. Now, let's talk about the things that you have to do or want to do to help these kids recover from all this trauma. And, um, you know, give me a day, just just a day um, that would explain a little bit about being a foster parent or being involved in the Guardian Ad Litem program. Well, what I found was that it was really good to get a schedule going with kids because I had three boys. So, you know, um, they were all school age and I had a full-time job. So, um, but I did have room, luckily I had room in a really good neighborhood with a really good school. And so I was able to arrange this. So basically, just as all other single moms, you know, you get up in the morning, you have to make sure that everybody's cleaned and dressed and teeth are brushed and breakfast is had and, and all their schoolwork is together and their book bags and you, you know, you run out the door trying to get them to school and, uh, and get to uh, work on time. Um, I worked all day and then um, I, they were in child care after school, which was paid for by the county. And then I uh, came and picked them up. Um, and then after school, of course, we had you know a dinner to make and everything. So we had a schedule of, you know, during that period of time uh, between while I was making dinner, um, that they were responsible for doing their homework and that I was right there. So if they needed any help or needed a one-on-one, -on -one, I could just stop and work with them. And one of the children did have a learning disability, so um, it was pretty intense. And you know, we sort of I spread it out throughout the evening so that they wouldn't, he wouldn't feel too overwhelmed. And um, we just read a lot. I read books. I you know, um, did everything I could to listen to him and encourage him in reading. And then you know, there was always the issue of fights, you know, that when he touched me or he pushed me off the couch. And you know, for me, we had a swimming pool in this community that I lived in, and the kids had never been in a place where there was a pool. So they always wanted to go swimming. And um, so I made a rule, the one firm rule, that if anybody got into a battle and touched anybody else, that everybody, those people would not be allowed to swim, and they would have to sit on the edge and of the pool and watch their brothers swim. So, so um, it sounds it like, uh, Marsha, that you treated them like they were just your, your own child. And, That's exactly um, what I did. Ah, one, okay. one of the foster children said to me, um, why do you love me? And he just couldn't understand that. And I said to him, okay, let's change the subject. I said, what if I said to you that I'm gonna, we're going to go to the pound and I'm going to buy you a dog? And he's like, yes, yes, yes. And I said, and I would let you pick out the dog. How long would it take for you to get to know this dog and take him for a walk? Would you agree to that and you know, clean up after him and make sure he's fed and watered and all the things that you would need to do with an animal? He said, yes, yes, I'll do them all. And I said, how long would it take you to love this dog? 
And he said, right away, as soon as I pick the dog. And I said, okay, well, then if you can love a dog right away that you don't even know, then why is it that I can't love you? Ah, interesting question. That's a great question. And what was his answer? He just looked at me and hugged me. See, he didn't realize he didn't know. He didn't understand because some of these children have been involved in such traumatic kinds of situations where they're abused and they're not loved. And you right. gave him the best answer you could possibly do, which is, you know, animals may be a very, very easy to, to love. And that's a great analogy for them. Now, here right. it goes. Um, you know, we live in a technological society. And I don't know where, whether this applies or not, but the, is it helpful that these kids kind of get on the computer and meet people and talk to people about what's going on in their lives? Should they have psychologists or psychiatrists deal with them as well? Well, you know, the thing that, that I found that with these boys, especially because they had been um, uh, abused, uh, that they they had gone through the system, and every time you go through the system, they they didn't see one therapist. They saw probably ten therapists. By the time this was all over, they got every time they changed a placement or every time they went into a, another part of the system, they saw another therapist, and they told their story so many times that then they refused to tell it again. And That's so. Right. And so, you know, unless you can get in terms of therapy, some consistency where because it's not easy for them to do and um, or it wasn't easy for them to do. And I completely understood that they would not talk to anybody about it. Really? Yeah. So, so you became, in a sense, you became their therapist. Well, I didn't really. I mean, I, you know, we, life was very busy because I felt like, like uh, it, being a parent as well as being a foster parent, that my obligation was to teach them as much as I could and to expose them to as much positive kinds of events in their life that they had never been exposed to. So every single weekend, we would do something. We would go to a museum. We would go to the beach. We would, we would, my daughter was in Phoenix, so we would drive to Phoenix. We would do something, and we were in, in California, so, you know, Southern California, so there was lots and lots of things for kids to do, and I never missed one weekend that there was not an adventure. And, now, um, go, go ahead, ahead. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. What I was going to say, so, uh, so what happened was is that they became um, exposed to as many other kinds of people and events in life as I could possibly fit into my world. Yeah. And what about your children? How did they deal with this, these foster kids? Did they encourage them to, um, to, to be friends or did you rather encourage them to be friends or to be like sisters and brothers, you know, typical, like this is a person who's joined our family now and I, I want you to be, you know, on a equal, be equal. I mean, is that you know, I never that had that discussion. Do? I never had that discussion with them. Um, they they knew me. Um, they knew how I was in terms of my ability to be able to take care of. They were all exchange students. I had exchange students in, so they knew my capacity. And they were all grown. They all were in college or finished college, and so. Um, you know, they all thought it was a great thing and, um, and all participated in numerous ways to help support me. Hmm. Now, did our, uh, you, you mentioned that they were supported. Now, uh, is the guardian ad litem supported by a specific state or uh, is it, you know, just something that people raise money for? Uh, how, did, how did they, do you get paid? I mean, what no, situation? It, um, no, it's a volunteer program completely. And um, any expenses or anything that you have are, you know, out of your pocket. Um, I kind of look at it like making a donation. Um, if you were to, you know, make a donation to a charity and um, and you wouldn't know after you made that donation what happened to that money, where it went or who touched it or, you know, but in this particular case, you know exactly what's happening with your donation of your time and effort because you see it. 
you're involved. Yeah. And um, and for me, you know, this is my and you know, so we of course we track time because the agency does get you know matching funds and needs to be able to prove that um, that they have the hours in um, you know of their volunteers to be able to you know get money. So um, and basically, what the gal uh, the administrative part of it does is they support all the volunteers in this effort right. and, oh, and work with the courts. Ah, now that you just mentioned something very interesting, and that is that they work with the courts. Now, it would seem to me that that is something that if you're a, a, um, a volunteer at Guardian Ad Litem, that you, you know, have to understand the law a little bit. Am I correct, or does it matter? Yes, and um, actually the, the week-long class that you take um, does, uh, you know, really prepare you for, you know, the greater kinds of responsibilities that you're going to have. Um, I have to tell you that I, they have additional classes, and I just finished taking a class on, um, you know, writing uh, court reports uh, to the court about um, uh, children and, and where they're at in, um, in, the, in, their, in their process. Um, you know, it's- it sounds very, very, very complicated to some degree, but it sounds extremely interesting. Now, you take yeah. um, a lot of people who are retired, and you ask them, uh, what do you do with your life? How do you kind of spend your days? And many of them say, well, we, you know, we're retired, and we want to go back to work because we just don't have anything that we know that would make us feel you know, happy, would make us feel involved, would make us feel like we're part of society. So what do you say to a person uh, about Guardian Med Litem when it comes to the fact that this is not an easy program, but it's a program that would give them the feeling, the feeling that they're, they have a purpose in life. What do you okay. say to that? There's two things that um, I want to mention about this. One is that I think that you need energy. Um, you know, if you're a person that um, is, uh, is tired or, you know, it's diff- you have um, any kind of malady that, you know, would prevent you from being energetic, um, it, it's difficult because you're dealing with children who are energetic. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, that's the first thing. The other thing is, is that, you, you know, you have to be sharp enough to be able to, you know, do a report, to fill out your timesheets, to be able to interview um, you know, I speak to schools, I speak to therapists, I speak to all, I mean, all realms of people who are providing services within this um, confine. And, and I, um, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's like being an investigator almost. So you have to be sharp enough to be able to, you know, really um, to advocate. That's really the word is advocate and you advocate in front of the courts, you know, by making reports and presenting them to the judge and you advocate for the children in terms of, of what their, the services that they're receiving and, you know, their foster parents and whether they're, um, you know, and how they're doing in the home. And um, I found the biggest challenge of course is academically because many of these kids have to change schools so many times that, you know, they, they get dropped and, um, and miss out on pieces and then it fall behind very quickly. You mentioned the schools, um, Marsha, and what do the schools know about this program and did they help you at all uh, and did they help the kids because they recognize that these kids are, as you said before, uh, they're often traumatized so it's not so easy for them to be, you know, really immersed in school or want to learn or want to, you know, graduate particular colleges because they're thinking about themselves. You know, they're probably involved in just uh, being, you know, off the what do they say? They say off the curve or something of that sort. So what about school? Yeah. Well, I found just the opposite, that every time I went to a school, and whether I spoke to the special ed teachers or I spoke to their regular classroom teachers, everybody was extremely helpful and very you know, willing to participate. They have, typically have had lots of experience with this. So they know us, um, and, they're, and because you know, we have court um, – you know, a, a court order to be able to talk to them, they're able to be open and help us in terms of finding the best solutions for, you know, academic issues. Does that mean that it works all the time? No. 
It doesn't, you know, oftentimes these are slow processes and, you know, teachers have a lot on their plate and, um, you know, it often works slowly. But, um, but the main thing is to be able to identify, you know, if there's a problem where the problem is and what can be done to help it. And that means getting everybody involved, sort of, you know what I mean, in, in this process. Sure. And, um, and so hopefully schools will participate in, the, in that avenue. I see. Now, um, I, I don't ask you to um, give a name, but you uh, have been working with a particular uh, young man, and I want our audience to know what you've done for him because it sounds like he went from being extremely depressed and ex- extremely traumatized to now a kid who loves his life. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm, you know, it's. I'm going to tell you that it's like from from my perspective. 100% the foster parents that he has. Um, you know, he's, they are so supportive of him and so knowledgeable. You know, both of them are in the, the educational field and, um, and so have a lot of experience. And, um, and they know how to parent and how to teach. Um, if there was one thing that's lacking in, in, or one of the things that I feel is lacking in the system it is the fact that um, that parents, both the parents of these children and also foster parents, um, are not really good at teaching. And, and it's not that they don't want to, it's that, that they don't know. They can only go by their life experience. But, it, but there's, a, there's a, a book called Conscious Discipline by, a, um, by an author called Becky Bailey. And um, this is an empirical work that she took. She's a teacher. And she took this empirical work from, about neuroscience from a Dr. Siegel and a Dr. Gottman about, um, you know, about the executive function in the brain, the front part, and how kids learn and how they behave and how different actions affect them. And her, her methodology is so effective that many of the schools have adopted it for, um, you know, for bullies and, you know, things in that avenue. She's on, on YouTube and she also has a website. So I, I would strongly advocate that, um, that both the foster care system as well as, um, you know, parents just on their own look into her book, Conscious Discipline. And then it's like it's not something that necessarily you can just pick up and read because the things that she advocates require action. And, um, but this is the, you know, in the long run, this is, will be very effective. Yeah. Now, of course, there is wonderful things that you could do with these kids. You talked a little bit to me about the fact that you brought one of these um, people that you're involved with, one of these young men, and you brought him to, or it was maybe another person, to a horse farm. Um, and as a result of their experiences with the horses, they were just delighted. And now that is just something that you do all the time. So uh, tell our audience a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's actually something that um, I, I kind of did with, like, lots of kids that came into my life, nieces, nephews, other young people. Um, kids love to feed carrots, horses, I mean, horses, carrots. <laughs> and so I went to a stable. I found a stable that would allow me to do that. I would pick up a couple bags of carrots and, um, and show kids how to feed them. And um, she – this one uh, girl that, um, that I, we're talking about loves animals, uh, loves horses, and, um, and so I took her there. Um, she was depressed, very depressed, and this is the first time I saw her smile when she was feeding these horses, and she had never done this before. So, you know, it was a real thrill, and um, I ran out of carrots before she ran out of energy to... <laughs> <laughs> to want to stop, <laughs> yeah. but um, but you know this is just like for me. Um, we're only required to go and see the children once a month, but yeah. you know I I don't feel like that's adequate. Um, I feel like um, we need to see them as much as as we are able to, and not necessarily in the in the home, 
but take them to do something. Um, like yeah. right now for one of the boys, I'm looking to buy him. You know, he likes basketball. So I'm looking to find some Miami heat tickets, you know, to take That's him true. to a basketball game. You know, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's more than just, um, you, know, uh, you know, observing. Um, right. You know, for me to be able to talk about this child, I need to know him. Yeah, and you've got to know him. And what have you learned from him? Well, you know, I mean, kids are really, really special, each one of them. They have, you know, huge individual qualities. But, you know, for this little boy, I'm going to say he's brave, he's strong, um, he's courageous, uh, he's empathetic, um, he's well-liked by people. Um, You know, I just, you know, and for me, like, I have a lot of fun with him. <laughs> you know, it's, it's on both sides. I mean, I really enjoy being with kids. And, um, you know, we were sitting in a McDonald's and doing truth or dare. <laughs> I was just laughing my head off, <laughs> you know. Isn't so, great? yeah, so, um, you know, so it, it's really, you, you know, the benefit is not just for them. The benefit is for you as well. I hear you. Now, what about the arts? You know, the arts have played such a large part in many uh, people, many, too many people, uh, people with Alzheimer's, for example, and this is not a good uh, analogy, but boy, when they see art, they perk up. Same thing I would imagine with kids as well, like music. Um, that must be fantastic for them. And um, I would imagine that if you put some interesting music on um, and listen to uh, or watch them, watch them, they would perk right up. You know, like I said, each kid is different. And, you know, you kind of get different vibes in terms of what they're interested in and what they are looking for and what, how, what they react to. And so um, this one kid that I'm involved in, I'm looking for, um, there's, a, uh, there's a sculpture place that teaches you how to use the wheel with pottery. And um, and I just think that that would be really good for her because she likes to be active and she likes to um, you know be hands on. So um, so you know with each kid it's different, um, and you kind of have to evaluate what they would want the most. Yeah. Just like human now, beings. Um, oh, like anybody, of course. Like and any now, human being. Is there- Ah, uh, yeah. Is there any issues with diversity? I mean, there are people uh, that of all persuasions, I'm sure. Um, and did you find that there's a person who, for example, is a, um, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, we know all the ethnicities. Is there a specific person who dealt with you in a different way because of their culture? You know, I find this, I found this throughout my entire life. Uh, you know, all of my kids were exchange students. Um, you know, I, like I said, I had students in. I um, and then, of course, um, many of the students that I, many of the foster children that I had were Hispanic. Um, like food, a lot hotter than I'm used to. You know, um, but I, you know, for me, um, I just consider us all the same. We're human beings. And, you know, we learn about our culture through, through our experiences and through our family, and it's all good, you know. And, um, and I, like, I don't, see, I, I don't see any differences in people, you know, except, you know, except in terms of who they are as, as individuals. Um, and so I'm, you know, I sort, really I'm sort of blind about this, and it, it always surprises me. But this is one of the areas that are discussed um, during training. And, um, you know, and many people apparently do not, do not have the same feeling that I do. Yeah. What, is it, what kind of feeling? What have they told you? Well, you know, how, how did they deal uh, with these different kids who come from a different culture? Do they kind of in, immerse them in things that they think are part of society that they come from? Um, I would like to know a little bit more about that. Well, you know, I don't know about about other people. I can only just tell you about my own experience. But I, um, you know, I think that you have to be very respectful um, and show an interest, um, especially, you know, when you're dealing with the parents of these children, you know, who, who desperately want their children to maintain their culture. So, um, 
you know, I remember taking the kids to Alvera Street in Los Angeles and, and, you know, this was the first city in Los Angeles and, and it was all Hispanic and talking about, you know, how this started, where these people came from, you know, indigenous people who lived here and the whole history and the culture of the area. And, um, you know, and I tried um, to find, I asked, I would ask the mom for recipes or how, um, how the children like, what they like to eat. And, um, and was there any specific thing that they liked, you know, me to cook? And, um, you know, because food is always, you know, heavy in a culture. And, um, you know, so it's, it really, really depends on the individual child. Um, now, I'm just interested in this, too. Um, of all the kids that you have as foster kids or, part, you know, the kids that participated in the Guardian Med Lighting program with you, um, is there one specific person who stands out who's done some amazing things with their lives? <sighs> you know, it's so... It's, it's it's such a spectrum. It's really such a spectrum. Um, you know, I have, you know, one child who, you know, we always laughed and said he was either going to be president of the United States or in prison, and he's in prison for life. Um, yeah. And then, you know, um, and, you know, going all the way through, I have, you know, another kid who, um, you know, finished college and became a teacher. Um, you know, so... You know the the spectrum is very wide. It's it's not easy. It's not an easy road, and um, and the kids who get through it very easily, you know, are from my, from my perspective, it's an anomaly, um, because you know because of the things that they have to go through and in their lives, and um, you know, so uh, you know that's why anything that we can do to help that process, and really the state of Florida you know, is amazing. If you graduate high school and get into a college, any college within the state of Florida, and you've been in the system for more than six months, they pay your full tuition. Oh, wow. Yes. I mean, they even have a... great. I know. They even have a program called Keys where they, um, where they, they found that kids need to be... Um, driving to be, you know to be living in a normal society be able to be successful so you know they pay for the permit they pay for the license they pay for their insurance you know when they get a car um, they do everything to encourage kids to be able to become independent and um, and you know right now um, I just listened to a uh, a talk about you know from school to prison and they talked about teenagers who were in jail in the state of Florida I think the most in the country I'm not you know 60% of those were came from the foster system Wow. yeah I mean you know so this is this behooves society to be able to take action and to be able to help these children and not you know, you can't think of it as, as a massive number of children. You have to think of it a child at a time. You know what I mean? Yes. One child can use your help. You know, and what can you do and help one child? Yeah. Um, last question, and that is, if people want to learn more about the Guardian Ad Litem program and uh, with all of your experience, how do they get in touch with you? Um, do you have a website? Um, have you ever written a book? What is it they have to do to learn more about the program? Well, I would suggest that they go online and, you know, um, Guardian Ad Litem, you can just look it up. It's very easy. And they have a whole website there and show you how to, if you want to participate, how you go about doing it. Um, anybody who would want to speak to me about it, for sure they can call me. Um, my number is 561-401-3441. That's 561-401-3441. And they're welcome. I'll be more than happy to talk to them. Well, my guest today has been Marsha Awad, who is a really amazing person who has a heart. That's what I think is the best part of Marsha. She has a heart, and she really does her research. She does her work to help children in all kinds of ways, particularly in advocating for them. But one last thing, Marsha, before we end, and I, I know people understand what the word advocacy is, but I want you to repeat 
um, exactly what advocacy is so that they really understand what they're going to get involved in, okay? Okay. Well, you know, basically the advocacy is, is meant to be an advocate in front of the courts. So you, you look at this child, you examine, and you observe, and you talk to people, and you find out about this child, and then you make recommendations to the court. And you're dealing with caseworkers, you're dealing with therapists, you're dealing with, you know, lots and lots of people, but you, t- you put it all together, and you say, and you, you tell the court, you advocate for the child, honestly, what is it that this child needs that you can help make better and that the court can help make better? What decisions can be made that can help make this better? And, um, you know, so I think that, um, you know, that it's, uh, you know, it's not an, a definitely easy job, but, mm-hmm. but it's definitely a worthwhile job. There you go. Well, today my guest has been Marsha Awad, who is just an amazing person, as I said before. And um, if you want to get in touch with her, she's given you her number, and I think it would be um, your obligation, in a sense, if you decide to be an advocate, to give Marsha a call. So thank you, Marsha Awad, uh, for being on the Susan Brender Show. It's been a delight, and I think that uh, everybody should listen to somebody who wakes up in the morning and feels so productive and who wants wants to help, um, in a sense, our society. Thank you, Marsha Awad. You're welcome. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for listening to The Susan Brender Show. To be a guest, email sebrender at yahoo.com.